Open only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or in, indeed good morning, and it's certainly good morning to our to our speaker who we'll come to shortly. Um, so welcome to our third BCA webinar. Um, we've certainly got time at the end of the presentation for questions, and, and I'd ask that people do submit those using the, the on-screen uh, uh, question function. Now, I'm personally very interested in, in today's webinar topic. I came into to coffee from agricultural sectors where there's a very clear focus on improving productivity and breeding and through breeding to meet the increasing environmental challenges that, that we all face. And, and the question I posed on my first day was how how was all of this structured in, in coffee? And, and, and if I'm honest, 10 months in, I'm still not sure that I've been able to fully answer that question. But it is uh, and continues to be a, a fundamental question and, and the challenges facing coffee production over the next 15 to 20 years are certainly significant. Who will produce it? Where will they produce it? How much will they be producing? And what is the coffee that they are producing? Climate change, pest and disease challenges, pest and disease resistance to pesticides and increasing regulatory restrictions on pesticides and fertilizer use alongside the obvious returns to the producer are something that need to be constantly on our, on our minds. And, and in my mind, these issues do have a common underlying theme and it, it comes back to, to my very first comment about productivity. How do we address, address the restraints on increased productivity and help to deliver a more sustainable business model for the whole chain from the producer onwards? Well, today may not deliver all of the answers, but it may well help to give us a clear indication of where we need to go. And, and I can't think of anybody better to help us with that than, than the CEO of World Coffee Research. And I'm delighted that, that Vern Long joins us today. So welcome, Vern. Thank you for, for joining us. And, and I know um, Alexa Heineke, your colleague, is also on hand and, and you'll both be sort of there to answer questions at the end. But, but enough from me, and, and Vern, I now invite you to, to take the screen. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and, and thank you, Paul, for that, that great introduction. I think these are the questions that we as a coffee community um, would do well to start really grappling with very, very intentionally and very focused. So it's wonderful to be here with you all today, and um, I'm joining you from Chicago, where it snowed again, so um, uh, it's it's, a nice cozy morning for me to drink my coffee and, and share with you some thoughts as we um, navigate this space. So um, if we could go to the next, the next slide. I, I think all of us have been contending with unending Zoom meetings and web-based engagement with our community and our partners around the world. And it's been pretty exhausting. I think we could all agree that we're pretty much done with this pandemic and we'd really wish it would be over soon. Um, the, the great thing is, is that, you know, people have been really resilient in handling this. Uh, our own team here in some photos are, you know, still out in the field practicing social distancing and or physical distancing and um, ensuring that they're washing hands and using personal protective equipment to keep the work moving forward. But it's, it's exhausting for everyone. And I think that when we take a step back and think about just how horrible this has been for the global community, and, and we're not over it yet. I mean, even though vaccines are coming to us, um, in the coming, you know, in the coming months and, and hopefully over the next year for the for the broader global community, it's um it's not over yet. <laughs> We're still in the middle of it, I'm I'm afraid. So um, when we think about this and and reflect on what kind of innovation was required to mobilize a response, if you could go to the next slide, I think that um you know it's stunning what scientists have done for us, and thank goodness that they did. Um, I was having a conversation actually with a, a professor from Oxford, uh, Doug Gollin, he's an economist, who um, actually gave me the, really refined my thinking for this talk, in fact. So I thought it very appropriate that BCA should be the, the beneficiary of a, a good conversation with a faculty from Oxford. And, um, you know, we were talking about how in the global community, the reason why we could have the fastest response in vaccine development and therapeutic development at the outset of the pandemic is because people thought about this in advance in the scientific community. The global scientific community was developing the platforms and tools that essentially we didn't know what the pandemic would be, what virus it would be, what pathogen it would be, but they were ready because they thought about it in advance. 
And so the platforms and systems were there, the scientific social collaborations were there that even before the, the, um, the virus had, had left China, the scientists in China had, had sequenced the genome and were sharing that information with the world. And that's because science was actually 10 steps ahead of the rest of us, making sure that they could mobilize their global community to solve our shared catastrophe. And that's really optimistic. And in a year of pretty miserable <laughs> situation for all of us, it's actually extremely hopeful and optimistic that scientists, if they can plan ahead and could put the right systems and structures in place, we can tackle almost anything. So um, what I wanted to, to flag here is, you know, going to the, the next slide is that in addition to that forethought that really brought us the vaccine in the fastest time possible, there's also delivery. And I think certainly in my own country, in the US, um, my siblings live in Canada, um, you know, we're all watching very attentively on the news, when can we get the vaccine? And the rollout is its own challenge. And I think that these are the exact same challenges we have in any um, scientific innovation. There's having the foresight to develop the systems to make it possible. They made it possible. The vaccine community's done it. They've done a lot all over the world. There are many versions of the vaccine that are gonna be rolling out for all of us. And then the next step, of course, is delivering it, getting it to us. We all are very attentive to this, right? So when we think about coffee, it's, it's no different, frankly. We've gotta have the innovation in place to generate the technologies that are needed to tackle the challenges of the future and even of today. But then at the same time, we also need to have a rollout plan. And we need to be thinking about those things all at the same time, because as we've watched with the COVID vaccine, which of course is an unprecedented scale of challenge, there's a lot of lessons to be learned about foresight, planning, being prepared, and then really thinking intentionally at the outset about how we can ensure technology gets to the end user as fast as possible. And I think that for those of us who are desperate to get this vaccine so that we can get off Zoom and get back in person, um, I think we all have a deep appreciation for the value of public health and the rollout process and getting it to the last mile, getting that vaccine, that technology into our arms. <laughs> I think we are very hopeful for that to happen soon. So what I wanted to do is, if we go to the next slide, is it's to really start thinking about this from coffee's perspective. So I mean, I in no way mean to to diminish the the or make them parallel situations, but I think that um, as a as a scientific organization, an organization really committed to science, we feel like we also want to take the lessons learned from the COVID experience and think about very carefully what does that mean for the way that we set up relational networks among scientists across coffee so that we too could mobilize response to emergent challenges and also even just the day-to-day -day challenges we already know about. So when we think about COVID um, and, and you know, we think about disease as being a perennial threat, um, this is a picture of production of coffee um, from Stuart McCook's book, he, a really great uh, book called Coffee is Not Forever, and he goes into the history of leaf rust, which is an example of a pathogen that really has wreaked havoc on coffee production um, around the world over the last couple of centuries. And, you know, the in the case of, of leaf rust, in the case of uh, Sri Lanka, the, the um, coffee industry there was really trying a lot of different um, approaches to tackle this, this pathogen and um, you know, different treatments, Bordeaux mixture, all kinds of things were tried by growers to figure out how to manage this pest, or this, this pathogen rather. Um, but the reality is, is that you know, they were overwhelmed and they were overcome. And it was both a, a function of technology and also government policy that led to that collapse. But the collapse of the Sri Lankan uh, coffee industry was, was pronounced and real, and it had huge consequences for the population that was really dependent on coffee as an export crop for, for their communities. And um, as consumers, few noticed it was a blip in the universe. And the reason for that is because the global community was sourcing coffee from multiple places. Multiple origins were there so that when Sri Lanka could no longer export at the volumes that people had been used to, uh, importers just shifted to other origins. And so when we think about that, um, we, we really need to take a step back as, an org as a community and think about what do we need to think about in advance right now to ensure that we're planning and thinking through the opportunities that need to be or the systems need to be put in place so that we can respond to the, the crises and challenges that are in front of us just the way that the global health community did it for us 
um, it, with the pandemic. And so I think one of the things that we wanted to really dive into is this question around our priorities. So what is it that we really priority, prioritize as a global community? And one of the um, four, there were four um, priorities that emerged from our global consultation last year. We really thank the British Coffee Association for participating and amplifying that survey out to all of you so that your voice could be um, included in this. And we're really thankful for those who participated. We had almost a thousand responses from our global survey that helped us really understand what the community was thinking about with respect to priorities for agricultural R&D. And one of the, the four top priorities was supply risk mitigation. And so this really is, was on people's minds. And what is so surprising about this is that it came even before the COVID pandemic. I would say probably everybody is very sensitized to this now. Even consumers are sensitized to this when, when consumers went to the shops and there were no paper towels in the, in the aisles. And it's because supply chains were disrupted. And so supply risk mitigation is something that as a coffee community, we've been contending with this globally for a few hundred years. Um, in the case of Sri Lanka, the response was to move to a different origin to shore up those supplies of coffee. But as we move forward and with the consolidation of production in fewer and fewer countries, because it's frankly not profitable and, and um, countries aren't competitive, and so they're shifting to other opportunities, there's a consequence. How much risk mitigation do we have in our system? And what do we need to do now to plan to make sure that we maintain that um, supply risk uh, mitigating you know, strategies going forward. Um, so the next slide. So when we look at the concentration of, of coffee, you know, we think about um, how Brazil and Vietnam have done an incredible job of increasing total volumes of production and have really dominated our global um, supply. And when we think about the, you know, the way that, um, you know, that's happened, uh, there's a great article actually in the global, if you go to the next slide, if you go to the global um, uh, coffee report, they did a wonderful story if, in the last few weeks about just what's led to this dominance between um, Brazil and Vietnam. And we just have some pullout quotes here, but you know, if, in, in the case of Brazil, there was a point that it would be, not, you know, it would be all for nothing if it weren't for national research bodies. That research has been at the foundation of Brazil's competitiveness, not just in coffee, but in all agricultural products. They're the second largest exporter of agricultural products. And you don't just do that because you didn't plan. You plan and you're intentional about your investments and you align your resources to ensure that innovations are developed every year so that your farmers can be at the leading edge competitively to produce that coffee for the world. And Vietnam is no different. Their productivity improvements have been remarkable. And it's a function of you know, their focus on research and developing high yielding varietals as um, Rabobank uh, noted. And I think that this commitment at a national level to R&D has really paid off well. There's just a tremendous amount of benefit that we as a global community have achieved from having access to that um, very stable and solid supply of coffee, but it didn't come from nowhere. And it was a national level commitment to R&D that actually brought that um, onto, this, onto the scene. So if you go to the next, uh, slide. So we see that the productivity improvements have actually shown that the innovations made it to the farmers. So these research innovations weren't just stuck in a lab somewhere, just like getting that vaccine out to the last mile, getting it to every arm across the world. We need the innovations from research institutes to get into the hands of farmers, because if they don't, then what, have, what are they for? What have we done? And I think that that's what, um, again, like when we think about lessons learned, what can we learn from the COVID pandemic, what can we learn from successful countries that have done a great job of generating innovation and then ensuring that that innovation is flowing to farmers, it's relevant, it's responding to farmer needs, and it's enabling farmers to tremendously improve productivity. Um, this is the kind of thinking that we need to, to do as a global community because the, um, the available innovations and the pathways to get those innovations to farmers are not so straightforward in many other origins. If you go to the next slide, this is a slide from um, the World Bank, essentially. This is a picture of the relative economic status um, of different countries. And so the dark blue countries um, are low income countries. The lighter blue are lower middle income countries. And you'll notice that um, it's, the resolution's not great, but if you, you know, if you go into this slide and, and think about it, you can also Google it on the World Bank's website. Um, the, the thing is, is that you'll see that most of the coffee producing countries are light blue or dark blue. And so we're talking about countries that are 
really committed to generating um, you know, coffee exports for us. We're dependent on them. Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Central American countries, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and Indonesia is lower middle income. Uh, countries are really contributing to the global coffee supply. But then we think, well, how, much, how many resources does a low income country have to allocate towards R&D so that they can generate the innovations for farmers that are needed? And so when we look at that, when we start to unpack like just how much money is happening, there are um, some, you know, some great statistics that have been compiled that show us just how much money is going into R&D. And you'll see that there is this benchmark of between one and 2% of agricultural GDP should be spent on agricultural R&D to essentially, it's a sort of a right-sized investment for a government to make or for the, for the private sector generally to make. Um, and that, and you know, when you look at Brazil, they're at 1.82%. So they are a powerhouse. They are tremendously innovative. They really rally their entire research um, uh, community towards these shared goals that really drive opportunity for farmers in Brazil. And when we think about the relative allocation of investment in Honduras or Guatemala, which are critical support sources of supply, Honduras is the third most important um, uh, exporter into Europe. It's the fourth most important exporter into the United States market. So, um, but then the relative allocation of resources is really low. And so the scientists are doing the best they can, but with far less investment than would be sort of normative for a right size for the importance of the crop, for the importance of agriculture generally to the economy. And, you know, these numbers, you know, just to be completely transparent, these numbers are the aggregate agricultural R&D. So the relative portion going to coffee is, you know, is very definitely more in, in Honduras and Guatemala. But the point is, is that the entire innovation community, just as we saw with the COVID virus, it's not one specific vaccine researcher that you need. You need an entire army of, of scientists to really tackle all the dimensions, developing therapeutic treatments, developing um, antibody treatments you know, that are part of the therapeutic regimen, and then as well the vaccines. You need a lot of different people looking at these issues from many different angles to develop the innovations that drive competitiveness and opportunity. And so when we look at the landscape of R&D spending, it's just, frankly, it's just anemic. And it's really not going to provide us that supply risk mitigation that we seek as an industry so that we can um, ensure that, you know, the continuous supply of coffee maintain this incredible industry that we all love. Um, and as well, the opportunity distributed across many countries to participate in an, a really valuable export crop. And so um, I think this is, you know, if we go to the next slide, I think this is fundamentally what um, this recognition of the landscape um, in 2012 is what the global industry recognized. And so World Coffee Research was um, was born because we uh, were um, we were really interested in focusing on how to ensure that we could bridge the needs of the coffee industry, coffee producers, and cutting edge science. And how do you bring all of those, you know, equities and um, and concerns as well as the science that can develop innovations that respond to those needs um, into one one roof. Um, so next slide. So uh, in 2012, WCR was was formed, and we um, uh, basically brought together this community. We've started to build these networks, and the and the the organization has moved forward with our work. Um, next slide. So one of the ways that we operate as an organization is really as a bridge, and so we recognize that there are many goals that. Uh, roasters have. You all have a tremendous number of sustainability priorities for the products that you, you produce. Um, and you also have a, a desire to help farmers. There's a deep and abiding interest and commitment to farmer profitability and concern about the long-term sustainability of farming and the immediate welfare situation for farmers who are contributing to our supply chains. And um, when we think about WCR and what R&D can do and what science can do, it's really about bridging that potential of what science can do and understand the farmer's perspectives and understand the roasters and the industry's perspectives and needs and bringing it together into a shared research agenda. And so um, we, we undertook a cupping this past year of some new materials and that's the kind of opportunity where roasting companies can start to orient the research agenda to, to ensure that the technology itself is responsive to the industry's desires as well as um, ensuring that the, the crop itself is productive and profitable for farmers. So it's all about figuring out what are all the specifications that the community has and how can we use R&D to solve for that. So it's really just about 
um, farmers having a voice to be able to communicate the needs that they have and ensure that the R&D agenda really responds to their needs. And at the same time, uh, the roasters and the, and the um, consumer facing brands can really ensure that they understand what they want to produce and provide that input into the R&D process to ensure that um, plant breeding and agronomy are delivering the kinds of innovations that respond to all um, ends of the supply chain. Um, if you go to the next slide, so WCR's mission is to is both a supply side and a welfare family livelihoods kind of um, merged mission. So our mission is to grow, protect, and enhance supplies of quality coffee. And so that is really at the core of what we do. It's really about ensuring the continued production of quality coffee and with a focus on uh, crop improvement and support to national breeding programs because they're so underinvested. Uh, because of the realities of the economic landscape in which they're operating. And so we really are seeking to strengthen the research capacity of national breeding programs um, to ensure that the varieties that they're developing are um, delivering value to farmers, but also value to the, to the uh, market. And I think that this dimension of the livelihoods of the families who produce it is really a, a key part of our DNA um, because it's, it's not just about more coffee from, you know, wherever we can find it. It's about not only supply risk mitigation for multiple countries because it's better for the industry to have lots of, of um, coffee from many places, but really recognizing that um, the livelihoods of families who are actively engaged in coffee exports in many countries provides a cash stream that's critical for all kinds of, um, of opportunities in a country. So the export revenues from Uganda, 16% of export revenues in Uganda come from coffee, which mobilizes resources to actually import products like uh, vaccines for COVID. So the interconnectedness of um, our work at the at the supply level is not is, is very much a hand in hand a part of thinking about livelihoods of families, both at the individual farmer level, but thinking about economic opportunity at a national level as well. In the next slide. So the way that we approach this is through our work together. So WCR um, is a bit of a, a different beast with respect to the kinds of organizations that are in the landscape. I mean, we are an industry organization. We have more than 200 companies who come together recognizing that there is a shared concern over the long-term supply of sustainable coffee. And we really need to work together with R&D as our tool to advance this agenda around farmer profitability and responding to the climate crisis, ensuring the quality of the coffee and mitigating supply risk um, through innovations together. And so, um, you know, over the last year, we've developed a strategy. If you go to the next slide, um, our strategy uh, was, was launched last July and approved by our board. And it really just clarifies that the kind of work we do is really focused on the variety. That's really where we see that there is tremendous step change potential is the development of new, higher quality, pr more productive varieties in close partnership with national breeding programs. Because again, there are many national research institutes across this landscape of countries from where we all are um, importing coffee from, but their relative capacity to work on some of these issues is limited because the national level of investment isn't there. And so we see our role as both a bridge to bring in scientific capacity to strengthen and, and to work alongside national partners, but also as a lever to uh, unlock additional investment to help um, increase the available resources to tackle this, um, this challenge and with a real focus on variety development. So um, it's, it's both through uh, ensuring that the industry has an opportunity to provide quality input into variety development, so cupping opportunities to provide those scores so that the national breeders can see, oh, you know, these varieties look like they have more potential in the market and these don't. And so that quality specification will be part of the decision-making process that national breeders have, in addition to ensuring that the variety is relevant to the farmer's field, really is responsive to the production system that the farmer is, um, is using. And so we see that all of this work around variety improvement is, is really foundational to our goals collectively to improve economic sustainability, but also respond to the climate challenge. So both adaptive technologies to ensure the variety works well in a changing climate, but as well mitigating. We really want to reduce the amount of emissions that are coming from coffee agriculture where it's possible, and then um, and, and ensure that uh, you know where we can sequester carbon in perennial systems, like that's a whole area that um, I think many are asking the question. And so we just wanna be a part of that conversation because 
when you're developing a technology, you want to know the landscape into which it's going to be operating. So if the world wants to move in a new direction on what production systems look like, the varieties need to be able to fit into that system. And so that's the kind of continuous conversation with the broader scientific community, especially around climate mitigation that WCR will be, will be having over the coming months and years um, to make sure that we remain relevant in the work that we do with national partners. Uh, so this is the, going to the last slide, essentially um, we, we really depend on the global industry engaging with us to help ensure that we're doing the right things. When you make an investment in agricultural R&D, it will really um, resonate with the farmer because this is an innovation that they need. And so they're inherently going to take it up you know, when, it's, when it's relevant and when the pathways are there to make um, adoption easy and there's confidence in the quality of the technology. The, the, the decoupling or the, the challenge we see is that so much of the agricultural research is happening at origin and there hasn't been a way for the industry outside production producing countries to have input into what the coffee tastes like or even the sustainability dimensions um you know we we all want to develop innovations that could be perhaps um you know less environment you know definitely less environmentally consequential or improve livelihoods and so how can we put our hands on the scale to ensure that the innovations are really responsive to these um, shared goals that we have with producing communities and um Without the global coffee industry having a voice in that, um, the innovations could go in a new direction. If it's more profitable to produce cut flowers, that's, that's what the farmers will produce. So it's our job on some level to really co-invest with national partners to ensure that the innovations make sense for farmers to continue growing because we wanna continue um, being active in the coffee industry and there's no coffee industry without farmers to produce that coffee. So. Um, this is really why we're here at World Coffee Research is to serve as a conduit for the global industry to invest alongside your peers and to ensure that the broader scientific and research agenda is really responsive to that industry opportunity, which then creates opportunity for farmers in a, in a virtuous cycle that we seek to, to cultivate and move forward. And so with that, I will um, open it up to questions. Uh, th thank you very much in, indeed for that, and, and and really just picking up on that that sort of final point that you know it, it, essentially it is in our own hands. You know, part of this destiny is is in our own hands to ensure that you know we we can give sort of clear messages to those who are looking to essentially decide, I guess, where where money is put. That that coffee has a very clear sort of view on what is needed and and, and therefore what the the sort of the the program re requirements are. Um, just a reminder to everybody, well, a couple of reminders. Obviously, whilst Vern has been speaking, Alexa, her colleague, has been putting a number of um, items in the chat and, and, and essentially links to some of the publications that Vern was referring to uh, during her presentation. So, so please drop into the chat to pick those up, pick those sort of links up for, for, for sort of future reference. Um, and, and again, we're sort of inviting people to, to put questions in. And, and I'm going to uh, afraid to jump in myself. I've got a couple. I'll, I'll certainly put one in and then see if we have sort of time for the for the other one. And 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 just going back to the to the slide Vern, that you where you highlighted the R and D spend. And you know we talked about Brazil and, and and clearly I know for a number of commodities Brazil had a very a very clear um, vision and direction sort of set out in terms of where it wanted to position itself and, and, and has put the sort of the money into R&D to, to really achieve that. Um, but you talked about obviously that, you know, that the, the, the money that's needed and the, the and, and, and obviously that money for our agricultural R&D is, 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 you know, that it's competing against a lot of other requirements. Now, the, the, the UK has just um, published a consultation on, on, gene editing and, and seeking the sort of the views of people in the UK about gene editing, where we should go, the, the rules, et cetera. And, and certainly for a number of crops that I've been involved in in the past, gene editing is seen as being much more financially viable, shall we say, compared to some other technologies and, and therefore more accessible for, for smaller plant breeding businesses and, and I guess for, for countries as well. Um, so the question is, do, do, does that hold true for coffee and 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 if it does do you see though that sort of technology and, and and that more available technology as 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 having a sort of a central role 
going forward in, in in coffee sort of irrespective of how we might be sort of using it but but just the sort of you know the concept does, does it open the door to the possibility of, of, of more people being able to put resource into r d right it's a great question i think that um we as a as a, a coffee industry have been um very cautious about the kinds of innovations at the plant agriculture level. Um, there's many kinds of innovations. Gene editing is, is um, one tremendously powerful tool. And I think there's two pieces to this. The first is, is there willingness among consumers and is there interest among brands to um, have coffee that's produced with various tools in the supply chain? And I think that that's the, the hypersensitivity that many um, coffee producing countries have is they want to ensure that whatever technology they used is received well by the by the industry and so there's you know a, and I think this is part of our challenge in coffee is that there is such a deep deep divide between the realities of plant science what's possible with plant science the um, the actual research that happens at origin to then generate innovations for farmers like new varieties and then the um, you know the the processing of the product in in consuming countries and so there's so little um, knowledge you know that just in terms of being able to do diligence as a coffee company if you wanted to say well should we be open to this technology or should we not be you know there's a very strong scientific and technical rationale that underpins the use of these tools um, but at the end of the day uh, i think that broader science education and consumer awareness about the pros and cons of different options um, are a really important conversation to have. Is the technology viable for coffee? Certainly, there's definitely interest. Um, there is a small country, actually, in the, a company in the UK that's um, tackling this and looking to see whether it's, you know, sort of a proof of concept kind of approach um, to see whether it's even possible. And I think that what's possible sometimes in science really needs to have um, deep consumer engagement and education as part of it and educating so that people can have a, a thoughtful deliberative discussion about um, whether this is a technology that the, the community is is open to and so as a science organization we're we're both here to educate the the industry so we're here because we want to provide those answers to you is the technology valuable yes is the technology going to solve problems that we can't solve quickly so the pain point in coffee is that it's a tree and it takes three years for it to develop cherry so that if you're a plant breeder using traditional means where you take the pollen of one plant and put it on the flower of the other plant to make a seed and then you plant that it takes about 28 years to develop a new variety so 28 years is a really long time to develop a new higher performing variety gene editing could accelerate that tremendously and cut that down by half or more than half in terms of the timeline for developing an innovation that's pretty significant and i think that as we face the challenges of producing countries with climate change we need to be having these conversations and i'm really glad that you're initiating this here because we need to think about what are we comfortable with and what information can we share with the community to help everyone come to a place where you feel you can have an informed discussion and make a, a consensus decision as an industry of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Thanks. And I think that's a very important message you make about how we sort of take this forward and in, 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 in the right sort of way. Um, I've got a couple of questions here which relate to the pande pandemic. I'm going to try and join them if I if I can. Um, the first part says that the pandemic has shown how important it is for the public to get behind and believe in a cause. How can we increase awareness around the issues that, that the coffee industry faces? And, and linked to that, I suppose, the scientific community was able to galvanise around a single problem, i.e. developing the vaccine for, for, for COVID. And, and, and is it a single issue where coffee is concerned? And if not, how do we how do we tackle that more multifaceted issue or, or situation where we've got multiple areas of focus? Wonderful question. So I'll, I'll take the second one first. So when we think about what it takes to respond to something as as chaotic and, and the crisis of the pandemic, yes, they focused on a single issue, but the platform that was built in advance 
was very flexible. They could have gone in many directions as needed. There was incredible nimbleness to what the scientific community had built in terms of ability to respond to a major global disaster. And so I think that that's the first thing that I would say about coffee is that because coffee is so competitive between countries, there is a place for competitiveness and we are all for national country competitiveness and countries taking advantage of their own national assets to do great in the industry. Like we, as businesses, we want to diver differentiate our products. Countries want to differentiate production and provide you with new and innovative products so that you can integrate them into your blends and into your products. So <clears throat> diversity is great. Diversity brings strength to us. Um, but there are parts to, and competitiveness is, is a part of the game. The challenge is, is that there are some things for which it's very important to have a research network bonded. And that's what we are hoping to cultivate alongside their many collaborations. CIRAD is a major research institute in coffee. Brazilian universities have been leaders in collaboration globally. I mean, um, they've been very uh, collaborative in, in coffee research. And so we are just one more member of this um, community, but we bring the industry voice because we're an industry organization as opposed to just a purely research institute. Um, you know, with a, a, a broader remit. And so we're interested in specifically coffee and in bridging the research community so that we can all be prepared for the challenges. Leaf rust is a perennial one. Leaf rust has reared its head yet again. I mean, in, in um, the, the last 10, 12 years in Central and South America, leaf rust was devastating for many producers. So there are those moments when mobilizing the community would be really critical to tackle that very specific issue. In the big picture, the the need to just improve the efficiency of coffee research is where we are right now. So the good news is agricultural research has moved rapidly forward in some of the leading crops in in corn and soybeans and maize and soybeans. They have done a tremendous amount to figure out all the different ways to accelerate progress and other crops have been catching up sort of, it's kind of like going from a landline to a cell phone, like don't invest in all that copper if you can just get a, you know, a, a, a cell tower and a cell phone and you can reduce the sort of infrastructural investments to get you there. In the same way, coffee has, is, um, as our director of research likes to say, coffee is like the caboose of a train, you know, and maize and soybeans are up front. And so we want to go through all the different cars of the train and pick up the tools and technologies that different crops have used that have been really helpful to them to accelerate progress. And that's what we see as our role at WCR is to help national coffee institutes become aware of the innovations that have been generated in the other trains of the car and move forward and get out of the caboose and be closer and closer to the leading edge so that we can accelerate progress on the range of issues. Because yes, there are absolutely a bunch of challenges facing coffee production, water efficiency, um, fertilizer use efficiency, reducing emissions. There's a lot of challenges to production, but a lot of the tools are already there. We just need to apply them to coffee. And because of the siloing of research, um, which is you know a historic thing and it's, it's not specific to coffee, we just wanna break down some of those barriers and then bring these tools that have been used in other crops to accelerate progress so that you can tackle many, many things at once because the tools were already there. We just need to bring them into coffee. Um, and would you mind just flagging the first question again? I missed it. Sorry, Paul. Um, I, I think the, the first one was, was saying that the, um, the, the pandemic had shown how, how the, the public could get behind, um, how, sorry, how important it was for the public to get behind and believe in a cause and, and how mm -hmm. can we increase the awareness around the issues? And, and maybe if I just sort of link that to another question, which which just follows on from what you've been saying, if you could then sort of talk a little more about how you see WCR's role in, in cascading out the, the sort of the, the, the research findings and recommendations that you get to farmers. How, you know, is that through national boards? Is it through governments? Is it outreach? Is it a mix of all of those? And so maybe talk about how how that helps to get to that part of the of the sort of the, the community, if you were, rather than and, and then also talk about how we how we sort of end a little bit more engage the make sure we engage the public in in understanding what we're what we're about, which is something I'm you know very very interested in as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I, I think that when it comes to consumer engagement and awareness and, and the public's broader understanding, it, there's, you know, basic 
science literacy, which we feel that we're responsible for helping you have the tools, the communication tools to explain this, you know, just even within your own companies to, to bring everybody onto the same page of why science and technology, research and development are critical tools for the long-term sustainability of coffee. Um, beyond the scientific literacy question, I think there's, there's just broader questions around equity and economic um, asymmetries. And I think that with a globalized world and social media, we've all been able to become much more aware of how things are operating in other countries. And I think that just greater global awareness is key. Um, I'll give a plug for one of my favorite books, which is called Factfulness. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't read it to read it. Um, it's by Rosalind. He was a, he's a Scandinavian um, scientist. He's unfortunately passed away, but he, vis he helps visualize complex information and helps us understand, um, you know, just how the world really is and that the world is actually getting a lot better. And I would, he has, um, Gapminder is his website. So you can go and his, his children actually have continued on with his work, but Factfulness is the book. And that gives you really concrete ways that you can start to think about how to communicate more effectively. Um, and Gapminder is his website if you're just not a book person. So um, I, would, I would encourage you to look at those tools because they really do help us think about how do we start talking about this as citizens, as parents of children in, in the local schools, how can we help um, move you know, a broader conversation forward? Um, the other piece of this is, um, how do we how do we mobilize science and how as an organization do we ensure that it gets into the into the hands of farmers and i think that that goes to partnership so we as an organization don't engage with farmers in the with respect to um actual transfer of technology we really see that that is harnessing the market systems in the country so there in central america there are um farmer co-ops who have nurseries and they are distributing trees to their members in the co-op and so we see our job as helping to connect the dots create the technology to reduce the costs the transaction costs along the supply chain the input supply chain from innovators to farmers and so um you know we're we're really interested in these questions around nurseries and helping strengthen um, national programs ability to clean up their seed lots to make sure they have genetically pure healthy plants that are being distributed in renovation programs and so forth it's through partnership it's the um, organizations like acdi voca or technoserve who are actively engaging directly with farmers where we seek to ensure that the the information that's being conveyed is the latest information as well as the um, opportunity to to improve the quality of the planting material that's in the in the input supply chains for farmers and that's all through national you know every country has a different system for distribution of plant material and what are the rules the seed system rules etc so we just work country by country in the specifics but um, it's about partnership with the local organizations farmer co-ops and others who are directly connecting and engaging with farmers Great, thank you. Um, a, a slightly more technical question now, and, 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 and looking at some work from, from the Research Institute in Columbia, and, and, and referencing back your comments about roast resistance, and somebody has suggested, said, as far as they're aware, the, the is it Senecafe 1, a, a multi-linear variety, was, was developed in, in six years or so. Is, is, uh, are our Senecafe and FNC involved and, and, and working with you on in, in these sorts of areas or, or indeed in other areas. Mm -hmm. So um, Senate Cafe was a participant in the original international multi-location variety trial. They provided a few Colombian varieties that were then grown around the world as part of this evaluation of existing varieties to see how they performed in different places. And, um, and that program is actually coming to a conclusion in the next year or two. And so the data have been shared with all of our partners. And so in that way, Sen um, Sene Cafe has been involved. Fundamentally, WCR works with countries that are do, do not have capacity. Sene Cafe has tremendous capacity. They're incredibly effective and competitive um, for their farmers and have generated innovations that really respond to the challenges their farmers have. And so I, to be really you know, candid, um, we, we don't actively work um, with the National Coffee Institutes in Brazil, Vietnam, or Colombia precisely because they don't need us. <laughs> they have tremendous capacity already, obviously, and are doing a great job of supporting their farmers. Um, but to the point about the need for, you know, for these higher order existential questions, like when we think about you know, if the really bad, horrible rust comes and we need to work together, absolutely. 
um, you know, they have my phone number and I have theirs. And if we need to mobilize rapidly, we can get everybody on the phone if there were something, a real crisis pathogen, you know, for the, for the industry. Um, and I think that's the key thing is that we need to we need to know where everyone is so that in the event that something really terrible starts to happen, that we can be in touch and mobilize a response. At, at this time, in terms of active collaboration, we really focus on the work of second sort of second tier countries, important exporting countries that don't have deep internal national research capacity, and we're really helping strengthen what they're doing. Thanks. I, I, I do like this idea of, of, of knowing where everybody is and everybody knowing that, that you know, when needed, uh, you know, people will come together and, and can come together. Mm -hmm. Just just a, a question now, which I guess goes to the to the to the, the very end of the chain the other way and, and, and looking at, at, at small independent uh, companies, roasters, etc. And, and somebody asking really if in that situation what what can they do to help achieve goals similar to yours or, or i guess even to perhaps to sort of communicate to the, the sort of the goals that, that that you know that you have absolutely so you know we are a member run organization we have many small companies that are members of wcr and you know i was i was making a comment the other day to to a couple of specialty roasters saying you know if the specialty roasters gave Five hundred dollars each. You could have, you know, a thirty thousand specialty roasters, very small companies. If they were to give five hundred dollars each, you would have six million dollars to run a program that would be completely dedicated to the very specific concerns and perspectives of that community. So it really comes down to um, there is power in numbers, um, which is critical. And at this stage of WCR's existence, I'll be really transparent. Like I feel like I am accountable to the industry to understand, to bridge that with the perspectives of national programs and farmer communities who are seeking technology for their, for their competitive, um, you know, for this opportunity for them. I see that the opportunity for smallholder farmers is the same, it's the same platforms. We need to be consultative and listen. So I'm here, now you all have met me or have seen me and can send me an email. Um, when it comes to aggregating the information, we ran the global consultation last year and we sent that survey out to all of you specifically so that everyone would have a voice. And then as you can see, like there was a consolidation of that voice. There were very, very clear priorities. The two top priorities, like hands down in that consultation in terms of the survey results were the industry wants to contend with climate mitigation and farmer profitability. Like, that's amazing. Like it was a really clear signal. And that was what from 896 respondents to the survey from the industry. We intend to continue that kind of approach where we seek out your input in these kinds of tools for us to aggregate information at scale so that we can then orient the R&D agenda appropriately. In the same way, there are similar tools that are used for aggregating farmer input that we would like to bring into coffee. They're actually done regularly in the cassava world um, where farmers have input into technology design. And we wanna bring those in over the next few years into our work in, at Origin with farmers to make sure that farmers' voices are heard. It's really about us being accountable to you. And so I would encourage all of you who are really interested in this and would like to learn more to, um, to go to our website and, and pick up some of the materials we have there, but then also um, to feel free to contact any of us um, at WCR to provide your insights and input and ask questions. We're always happy to do these kinds of engagements with uh, the industry associations. And if you all have a topic or a theme that you want us to tackle, we're happy to do it. We're happy to bring it to you. Thank you. Um, a, a quite a lengthy question here, so I'll, I'll read it out um, as, as given. Uh, for many organizations, any significant investment is much easier to justify when there are returns there for the, for the business's shareholders. And these generally come from increased revenues through short term, unique selling points or unique products. How can any organization justify investment when it's benefiting both themselves and their competitors? And I think that that is a, a question that is a fabulous question. And people ask me this all the time. <laughs> and I think that it comes down to one very, very basic point. And that the leader of any organization, any company has to think about enterprise risk. When you think about the likelihood of your business being able to function, to purchase coffee for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30 years, 
enterprise risk is a real issue for coffee. <laughs> if you are unable to differentiate your offerings because there are only two or three suppliers of coffee globally in the next 20 years, the likelihood of you're going to have to have a very, very strong in-house food science R&D team, product formulators to continue to differentiate yourselves with the same three ingredients or the same four ingredients from four countries. The value of origin diversity is tremendous to the entire industry to be able to differentiate your products, to have a lot of distinctive ways, both a marketing approach as well as the product itself being you know, very distinctive. It's only really possible if you have diverse origins. So I, I think that there is a type of risk in the same way as when you insure your business, there are certain types of risk that you buy insurance products for. And I would offer that WCR is the equivalent of an insurance product. It's like an investment in ensuring continued origin diversity, because that's at the core of what we're interested in is maintaining and preserving origin diversity. And that's something that every company understands as, a, as a, an existential or enterprise risk that all of you face. So I, I think, and that's why I think we have to do it as a community. And I think the more we come together and make a commitment as a community, then you, um, it's right-sized. You know, your organization contributes in ways that are commensurate with your peers so that all of your peers are crowded into this shared investment. And then the total cost to everyone is much, much lower as well. So, you know, I would offer, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's in your hands to decide whether enterprise risk is something that you are concerned about and whether continued engagement in the coffee sector with multiple origins to work from is a value for you. Thank you. I think we've, we've got time for probably a couple more questions. I, and I've got one, one which is very specific, and I guess one which is a, is a good opportunity for you to, to leave some final messages. So the, the, the specific question is, do you have any latest information on East Timor Arabusta? And, and then I think the general question would be, or, or the general comment would be, what are your one or two takeaway messages that, that you want to, to leave people with today? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um, so the, the first one on East Timor, um, so those materials, the Arabustas are, um, are a really important tool. They bring in both rust resistance and other types of, of pest and disease resistance for Arabica breeding, but as well, um, they're really valuable to Robusta if we're interested in exploring the ways of bringing in the Arabica quality traits into Robusta. So um, these, these materials are definitely at the center of, of much work. Certainly many lines have emerged from those, the Timor hybrids and continue to be an important source of, of rust resistance for the community globally. Um, and we will continue working with them as well um, with all of our national partners. The other piece, which is top line messages to leave you, leave you with today is that um, the exciting thing about technology is that you can develop a technology that responds to your desires for quality parameters or sensory per parameters that is also a good deal for farmers that improves their profitability and productivity. And that's what's exciting about science. It's not very common that you can make one investment that actually solves for many people's very different problems. <laughs> and so that's what's exciting about science. And that's why I was trained as a plant breeder and it's why I went into plant breeding in the first place is because it was so exciting that there was a way to solve for so many diverse concerns in, in one approach in, in technology development, like a new variety. So science and technology is optimistic. We can solve big problems and complex problems with R&D, but we all have to be at the table. And so I would say that coming to the table is critical and having your voice heard. And I think membership with WCR is a, is a key part of that, your ability to engage in the conversation. And as Alexa has put her contact information in the chat box, feel fully empowered to reach out to us and give us your thoughts and perspectives on this. So R&D is exciting because it can solve many people's problems and it can really tackle these very, very complex, wicked challenges that we have with climate change, but it's also tremendously optimistic. and you can have your voice heard no matter how large or small your operation is. That's great. That's a, that's a great message to, to, to leave us with. Vern. So on behalf of everybody that, that's, that's on the webinar, Vern, can I thank you extremely, very, very much for, for the time that you, you've given us today and for, for answering a, a fairly lengthy sort of list of, of questions with, with so, such full answers. And, and, and finally, I, and I guess, you know, Thanks also for getting up for you very, very early and then doing this very early on in the morning. It's 
it, it's a good job that there's nothing very much happening in the US this week, so you've been able to focus on. <laughs> it's been very boring um, here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks also to to Alexa, who's been sort of working, who's been putting a lot of stuff in the chat. So as I say, please please pick up on that, um, and and has also been sort of steering me to make sure I I pick up all of the questions. And, and finally, a thanks to everybody that that's, that have joined us, and, and thanks to, to to Seb and to FPF who've been running this the sort of the webinar. You know, we're, we're looking to do an, a number of other webinars as as we go through 2021, or irrespective, I guess, of, of, of where we end up and, and whether we're all allowed out again. Um, but really, I would encourage those of you to to sort of feedback to us. You know, other topics that you would like to to see us discuss, and 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 if you have speakers that you think you would you know you would like to sort of hear more from, then then please let us know, and and we'll we'll make sure that we we put something on as we go forward. So thank you very much. Thank you to to Vern and Alexa, um, and and everybody have a good and safe afternoon. Thank you so much.